Welcome to the Meddling with Nature podcast. This week, we ran into a few kinks with podcasts. Jeremy blames Dan, Dan blames Mike, Mike blames Nate, and Nate blames Aristotle. I blame all of them. But don't fret, my dear listener. You'll still get your weekly Meddling with Nature fix. We put all the blame on the back burner, dug deep into the archives, and found a short but enlightening lecture that Jeremy gave at a dissection years ago. And for those of you listening via a podcast service like iTunes, Stitcher, or Podkicker, don't forget to go to www.meddlingwithnature.com, where you will find plenty of additional information on this topic, as well as many others. Dissection is the process of intimately exploring the mechanisms which enable life not only to exist, but to maintain a perpetual application of design. Well, not unchanging in time, eternal in principle, we find more complexity in our tiny form than that which is in the stars. Such simple matter the universe is made up of. Uh, The sun's nuclear reaction focuses on just two elements, the most basic hydrogen unifying into the second most basic helium. Now, other bodies in the universe interchange a greater number of things and put forth spectacular shows with inconceivable energy, but how much of this is provided by the governance of physics? Are we also not just as quantum? Do we not share the same laws of gravity as the Orion Nebula? It's easy to become overwhelmed by the sheer size and potential of the universe. It can oftentimes make us feel so incredibly insignificant. Our concept of time is rigid and short and physically linked to unchanging forces. Our ideas of scale are based in mass and matter, yet we're not locked in. Perhaps it's the very vacancy of the complexity in regards to material organization of the universe that quiets our minds enough to focus on the subtle laws of nature. Such a rare intricacy, though, distilled and intensified, we find in even the most common of earthly designs. The conduit of life, the expression of mind, we truly are the unpredictable elements, the synthesis of order and chaos, the voice and passion of the universe. This requires us to treat the process of dissection with reverence and humility. And its uh, its somber importance has not gone unnoticed in our history. Dissection is a highly provocative practice. Societies have developed a strong sense of aversion to this kind of body objectification. In fact, there isn't a culture in time that has not grappled with this subject in a generally negative way. We must be very clear as to dissection's taboo nature because it is entwined with its importance. Diversion is not brought on by some simple gut reaction to blood or muscle, as most of us are omnivores and quite used to it. Rather, it's often considered to be meddling with nature, a transgressionary action that perhaps could also be an unpleasant reminder that what we are now they once were, and what they are now we will be. Our physical understanding of self is topographical for most of us. The things that happen underneath the skin are real, but oftentimes they're not who we are. We would sooner identify with the amount of melanin in our skin over our blood type. (laughs) No one ever waged war on AB negative. As we can see, most of the violence and conflicts that arise in culture are completely arbitrary and at the surface level. We compartmentalize our subsurface world in blatant ways. We see our aches and pains as things that happen to objects we possess. Even when it comes to our very brains, the seat of consciousness, we use the adjective my, which evinces a divorcement of the concept of self from the internal machine, as we like to envision it. When our mirror shows a depth greater than we're used to seeing, we're likely to become a little bit uncomfortable. In fact, we can't help but associate sights of these internal structures with pain and death. Of course, thoughts of death can throw many of us into a crisis of consciousness. And some say humanity invented God as a way to handle the biological drive for survival once we finally figured out that some things simply can't be survived. So Grandma's in a better place now. But if we should believe in the continuance of consciousness and the individual survival after death, how do we define the limits that grant these spiritual attributes? Uh, Is there a heaven for cats and dogs? 
What about fish? Slugs? Pumpkins? Or perhaps the very living organisms with our own bodies that help digest other organisms? It's this question, amongst others, that have spearheaded the need to separate ourselves from the rest of nature. The arguments are difficult, entwined with many powerful players, not the least of which is consciousness and will, but more principally, the whole of philosophy and science. Two great pillars, joined by an ever-sending succession of bassoirs, bound by an indiscernible and quite theoretical keystone at its heart. Our need to be categorical has resulted in the subjugation of the rest of the animals outside our fuzzy borders. This is what makes it okay to see if Moroccan red number five lipstick will kill a chimpanzee before it makes an insurance adjuster's lips look overly engorged with blood. We can admit that the stuff we're composed of is the same, but the stuff of consciousness is unique to us alone. Of course, this old way of thinking has been shattered as of late with new research that challenges our understanding of what it means to be conscious. But we still might rather believe whatever makes it easiest to justify our actions, for now at least. We, we haven't even agreed by majority, that the process of evolution even exists. While the argument can be made that humans are remarkably separate from animals, the same argument can be had for their similarity, especially in a mechanistic sense, and especially when it suits our needs. For the purpose of this section, animals have been relatively free from the same moral scrutiny that we've imposed on human cadavers. It's because of the non-humans' inhumanness and the nature of our predatory impulses that allows for dissection and vivisection of animals. It's, it's, it's interesting to know that until relatively recently has medical practice based its advancements on the findings from human cadavers. Even Galen, regarded as the father of dissection and physical anatomy, was not allowed to open the human dead. In fact, his medical texts and surgical insights came solely from the dissection of analogs, such as monkeys, pigs, and dogs. A point which delivers even more puzzlement by the readiness of Western civilization to leave his findings unchallenged for no less than 1,500 years. Not all of this was just a study of blinded comparative anatomy for Galen. Um, early in his career, Galen was an active surgeon to some very active gladiators. And one can imagine the sorts of treatments required by his hands. Of course, the spraying of blood, the sand, the roaring crowds is not an environment for the kind of study needed to develop a deus supartium, or mechanical theory of the body, as Galen would call it. Nonetheless, it did prove to Galen, early in his life, that there was much more to Hippocratic medicine and the medico-philosophic texts, which address only external observations and spiritual understanding related to the demiurge or uh, divine architect. We, we understand this concept as a kind of artisan god, responsible for the setting in motion all that is and all that will be. At the end of the day, Galen was required to do what all scientists do, make predictions based off of available data, oftentimes from memory and without the benefit of the same careful analysis he performed on his pigs, he just never really bothered to mention that his experiential knowledge regarding human anatomy was not necessarily living up to the standards of examination that he so rightly pontificated. It was up to Andreas Vesalius to bring that embarrassing skeleton out of the closet complete with fused mandible. But we could forgive Galen, for even though he did suggest that he did all the work so he didn't have to, Whoever seeks fame by deeds, not alone by learned speech, need only become familiar at small cost of trouble with all that I have achieved by active research during the course of my entire life. And that's kind of how Galen was. He maintained a strict belief that these observations were self-evident and attainable by you, so long as you didn't mind getting your hands a little bloody. But, you know, he kind of took care of a lot of that for you. In fact, one of the core beliefs of Galen, and nearly every anatomist that followed him, has been look with your own eyes, touch with your own hands. And that's why we're really here today. Uh, to talk about the history and action of dissection without participating in one at the same time limits our understanding of the subject uh, that is so experientially based. To do otherwise would be kind of like talking about your friends behind their backs. But why would someone so incredibly precise claim to have unified all teachings of Hippocrates without ever having once dissected, dissected a human being? Perhaps this becomes clear when we're reminded of the state of things pre-Galen and the total absence of influence from the body anatomy itself. Galen had one goal in mind, the codification and unification of Hippocratic medicine. He sought to be the one and only authority in medicine and the rightful heir to the entirety of of the Hippocratean corpus, which was a substantial one. At the time of Galen, an overwhelming number of sects had developed, each one having their own particular perspective. If we should care to look at this from a religious perspective, 
But Galen can be seen as a sort of Christ-like figure for medicine, and he assuredly thought of himself that way, and that's not really a compliment. He did this as a sort of self-sacrifice to humanity, to carry the burden of cleaning up history's mess and misinterpretation of Hippocrates. He was careful not to, to attempt to invalidate Hippocrates, but rather focused on the degradation and corruption done to this work by his students and subsequent followers. Well, Galen was directly basing his writing off of that which he was seeing with extrapolation. The founding of Galenic medicine soon departed observation with only an ethereal, conceptual, redesigned Hippocratic philosophy remaining, which went running the way of religion at a remarkably fast pace. Civilization requires a safe button for ideas it considers critical in the same way that we individuals enshrine objects of great importance. The important becomes precious, the precious becomes sacred, the sacred becomes untouchable. Once codified investigation, the act of questioning becomes heresy. We see this today, and they write it off as some expression of complexity, but we at least have a lot of additional modalities now that protect us from the magnitude of changes faced by the fetal sciences e even just 200 years ago. The fact is that those who are enslaved to their sects not merely devoid of all sound knowledge, but will not even stop to learn. That too is Galen. Of course, making science sacrosanct can be found in more than just Galen's anatomical arena, but there's something obviously personal about medicine and anatomy. It's an exposed nerve. A science that addresses the whole of human life and death. You throw a little God gasoline, how much more potentially religious could you get? As we begin to grow up in the age of reason, Western civilization began to relax the constraints placed on Galen. Renaissance masters began to push the envelope as culture begrudgingly allowed itself to be dragged into a different mindset. You see, good art and science comes with good understanding and practice. And that was the very idea that allowed the issuance of a papal bull that allowed anatomists as well as artists to begin a much more public work on the human species. The door opened, but there was an ironic twist down the hall. Ideas that were, at times, thousands of years old became even more sacred, but for very different reasons. Ancient wisdom, exotic cures, classical ideals, though pagan, became high fashion. The rebirth was upon us. The procession of the material sciences began to oppositely orient itself to the nostalgia-driven populace. We see this tendency today as we search through the internet hoping to find some ancient Chinese cure that contradicts the million other search results that don't provide us the answer we hope to find. We look at the fathers of one thing or another expecting to revive some mishandled truth or secret that the rest of the world just couldn't understand at the time in much the same way that Galen did. Perhaps we might even adopt a name here and there to lend a bit of ancient credibility to our own theories. When Andreas Vesalius was permitted to cross the species line during the late Renaissance, he, he had a Paganini-like effect. The tempting of God and nature and his perceived sacrifice of morals must have likened Vesalius to Prometheus, a fire-bearing titan for humanity, but certainly doomed to be punished or afflicted in some similar way. Dissection and inquiries into the inner workings of the body still can be seen as a sort of guilty pleasure at its best by most, and oftentimes as a sort of sublimation at its worst. We, we still insist on, the sh on shuffling our feet, holding back disgust, and giggling nervously when confronted by the exposed gross anatomy of these specimens. There are still those that directly correlate the practices such as these with violent tendencies and maladaptive social behavior, as though dissection is some kind of gateway to the gratification of causing pain and implementing sadistic torture. But Vesalius, well, he didn't have many friends on either side of the aisle. Vesalius was a performer in a lot of ways. He developed a, a type of flourish not seen since the time of Galen. And it was the work of Galen and its promulgation that Vesalius had issues with. At the time in the late 1500s, going to a dissection was a bit like going to Mass on a high holy day. The professor sat aloft the tall chair above the congregation. He was never to allow the ground to soil his educated stockings. From here, the professor would quote passages from Galen in a sermon style as the anatomist stood below, awaiting the moment in which the dissection would commence, at which point he would begin interpreting the scripture and directing the surgeon, uh, the one actually doing the dissection, who also tended to moonlight as a barber. Most often, the dissection and the sermon were not directly related, as there was no need to provide verification for Galen's work. The dissection was supplemental. It was, it was a sort of sideshow to get students in the door, like wine at church. There were locations in which the demand for dissection over lecture was a bit more prevalent, and that's exactly where Vesalius would find himself. Vesalius was more of a sole demonstrator, and his reputation for this was, was becoming known throughout Europe. He, 
It was likely because of this does not play well with others tag that he earned a degree and a post at Padua University. This, this highly effective and progressive university likely thought a little shake-up in the routine might benefit the students, who, at that time, were in a much more powerful state to make decisions regarding faculty than is currently the case in our modern, modern system, one that we would do well to go back to. There is some evidence to suggest that the whole affair was set up to oust the sitting professor, who was known for his rigid representation, presentation of material. At Padua and Bologna, I performed dissections rather more often, and having exploded the ridiculous customs of the schools, I taught in such a way that in anatomy we might want nothing which has been handed down to us by the ancients. That's, that's from Vesalius, uh, preface to the, on, on the fabric of the human body. Vesalius, as respectful to Galen and Hippocrates as he was, discovered, not surprisingly, many falsities in the ancient work. Even with physical proof on the slab, people were still unwilling to believe that the word, the logos, perhaps was not always enough. He continues, And so, with their teeth set, the principal followers of Galen put their trust in some kind of talking, and relying upon the inertia of others in dissecting, they shamelessly abridge Galen into elaborate compendia. They don't depart from him a hair's breadth while they are following his sense, but to the front of their books they add writings of their own, stitched together completely from the opinions of Galen, and all of theirs is from him. The whole lot of them have placed their faith in him, with the result that you cannot find a doctor who has thought that even the slightest slip has ever been detected in the anatomical volumes of Galen, much less could be found now. Meanwhile, especially since Galen corrects himself frequently, and in later works written, when he becomes better informed, he points out his own slips perpetrated in certain books and teaches the contrary, it now becomes obvious to us from the reborn art of dissection, from diligent reading of the books of Galen, and from the impeccable restoration in numerous places of the text of these books, that he himself never dissected the body of a man who had recently died. Although the dry cadavers of men prepared, so to speak, for the inspections of the bones were available to him, he was misled by his apes and undeservedly censures the ancient doctors who had busied themselves with the dissection of men. Nay, you may find a great many things in his writings which he has not followed correctly in on the apes. Not to mention the fact that in the manifold and infinite difference between the organs and the human body and that of the apes, Galen noticed almost none, except in the fingers and the bending of the knee. This difference he doubtless would have omitted too if it had not been obvious to him without the dissection of man. And that is Vesalius on the fabric of the human body. These problems Vesalius refers to here are not simple arguments and misplaced arteries, but incorrect, incorrect muscle attachments, organ alignments, non-existent bones, and, in, and one of the more stranger examples, invincible ones. We can understand how, how some of these mistakes could have been advanced by followers by looking at our own tendency of exaggerating certain facts to make them appear more legitimate. But the difference between the, the, the problems that Vesalius had and the problems that Galen had is Galen was dealing with dozens and dozens of authors. Vesalius was dealing with, with one. And this information is, is written in text. It's, it's not the same as kind of a passed down thought. Uh, so while trying to be respectful of Galen and the work that he was doing, he really was attacking him point blank. And these are stark examples of how highly the mind was regarded and how vulgar physical uh, experimentation was deemed during this transitional period. For example, Aristotle might uh, suggest a 10-pound weight would find its way to Earth faster than a 1-pound weight. However, when this was actually tested 1,500 years later, we find out that it's not at all the case. Yet many, even after seeing it with their own eyes, would dismiss the event. They, they looked on experiments like this in the same way in which we watch a magic show in Vegas. But there are reasons as to why this occurred. And there's a major difference between um, the difference of ideology and this, these kind of experimentations of, of, of the body. We look at Galileo, for instance. Galileo, uh, who, who incidentally took on a post of mathematics a couple decades after Vesalius took on his as anatomy, well, he's famous for one major thing, and that's uh, finding out that there are things that rotate around other things, and that was a, a, uh, a heresy against God that the Jupiter had moons meant that not everything revolved around Earth. And obviously, in, in this pure world, everything must center around Earth. Now, Vesalius was challenging the god Galen, uh, 
Galileo, in a lot of ways, was challenging the God God. And so his punishment was to be self-imprisoned for the remainder of his life and have to recant. Vesalius, on the other hand, with his hot temper, managed to shipwreck himself on some godforsaken island and was never heard from again, body never found in his late 40s. Many ancients believed that the purity of thought trumped the gross observance of things in motion in this corrupted and unclean world. When we think of such a contrary practice to our own scientific method as a sign of respect for mind, we can come to a more forgiving understanding for our ancestors. Death was the perverter of life, and thinking so, the Renaissance mind can conclude that evil corrupts the understanding of the good. This made a reasonable case for thinking rather than doing. In effect, uh, the physical world was indeed perceived as much more of a parlor trick of existence rather than what we might understand today. As we drew closer to our own era, we began to understand that the world was not sleight of hand at all, but that a unified perfection born of thought was, well, utopian. Static became the unnatural quality as we began to favor the dyna dynamic. Our new circumstances opened the door for us to experiment, something, something that had not really been thought of before as a cornerstone for understanding. We, we began to question, <coughs> invent, create, and explore, and yes, sometimes with devastating consequences. And this shift in perception is a potent reminder that we do, in fact, stand on the shoulders of giants, but we must keep watch on those lumbering and wide steps to ensure that our giants have their shoes tied. We now prepare to follow through with this advice. We touch with our own hands. We see with our own eyes. But we do so not so much to find divinity, discover the template of life, a philosopher's stone. We endeavor to discover for its own sake, because it makes us better. It informs the directions in which we might go. We relieve, relieve ourselves of the limitations that were so debilitating in our past by only looking to that which could provide a complete truth. We understand now that the physical world is made up of interpretable truth that can be formed and altered into similar or radically different truths about what and who we are. Of course, this manner of fracturing relies not on singular discoveries, but entire conference centers full of, hello, my name is, badged specialists who can barely talk to one another about each other's work due to the complexity of it all. The giant may take two steps forward, and perhaps just as many back. Oh, but the way in which it pirouettes while doing so is really quite something. But now we perform this ceremony. We look at ourselves in the mirror. The reflection, nothing more than a platonic shadow on the wall, the now darkened corpse serves as an illuminating conductor of those elemental things that make us animated. We look into the unlit folds of this tapestry to find its base canvas, naked, without familiar form, boundaries apparent. We're able to lose ourselves in a singular expression of creation, whole and self-contained. It's a planet with an atmosphere of skin. We see the body's great cities. We see the brain, the capital in our world. Rivers and roads, their tributaries running forth to other metropolitan giants, each serving some function independently, yet coexisting off the trades of others. And further explorations reveal other smaller independent lives, whether they be specialized cells or bacterial travelers foreign to the body. The government and public consensus of this world, provided by the very neurons in their collective actions that act on the macroscopic level. All these great and wonderful things are provided here. And six cubic feet that we're composed of much the same way as the two cubic feet of a coyote. All is knowable here. It's not restricted by the intelligence of a professor, philosopher, physicist. This coyote doesn't care what any of us think. It's not a functional model with elegant descriptors meant to teach or replicate analogous reactions like a pocket watch simulates time. It's the beginning and the source of it. Clarity, discovery, the understanding just depend on our ability to perceive and connect. This feeds our work here, not only by the information gleaned, but by the process in which to harvest it. We take care to marvel in the comparisons, but respect the unique qualities of every specimen, whether human or canine. And perhaps we can appreciate the work of the anatomists before us and see a tantalizing glimpse into the design, the demiurge they worked so hard to find, though maybe we can restrain ourselves from the requirement to define it. Perhaps we'll have a better appreciation for the unmistakable similarities between muscle attachments and venous paths that will serve not only to facilitate a bridge between species, but become a more self-aware. Touch the specimen's palm. Feel your own. Rotate the arm. Do the same with yours. Before us is one final photograph of a life lived, the only truly finite moment in any of our lives. 
Through this last record, we see all that came before if we know where to look. It's written on every bone and within each fiber of muscle. We're not just looking at a cause of death, but a cumulative action of life. And not just a, a life, but life! And if we add a bit of our own inquisition and spirit, we become that much closer to its meaning. We begin with ventral incision. Well, there you have it. Everyone here at Meddling with Nature hopes you enjoyed this special throwback edition of the Meddling with Nature podcast. Again, for additional information, visit www.meddlingwithnature.com for more information on this topic and many others. And thank you for listening.